it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Woman of the Inner Room Dr. Osborne, hastily summoned to the receiving hospital, found there a handsome, well-dressed young man with an ugly hole in his skull about an inch and a half above his left ear. The injured man evidently was not suffering, but the desperate nature of his hurt was seen in the deep pallor of his face. His expression was placid, unintelligent, and absolutely silly. Yet he was freely alive. His breathing was good. His heart observed its functions. His temperature was normal, and his skin was warm and moist. Dr. Osborne cleared the wound with a sponge. How was the lad hurt? He asked one of the officers who was standing about. No one could tell. A few minutes ago, someone had seen him staggering along the street, clinging to the house walls to keep from falling, a thin stream of blood trickling down his face, and had pointed him out to a policeman. Dr. Osborne closely looked at the wound. Then he tried to insert a finger in the opening, but failed. He looked around upon the men and asked them to show him their hands. No, he said after examining them. Your fingers are all too blunt, Farley. Go and call my daughter. She's sitting in my buggy at the door. Before she came, Dr. Osborne asked, Do you know who he is? None could inform him. Not a scrap of paper by which he might be identified could be found upon him. The surgeon's daughter entered. She was an attractive girl, rather tall and slight. She had brown eyes and hair and carried herself with a fine, unconscious grace. She glanced at the man lying on the operating table, suddenly checked her advance and became pale. Her father, with a reassuring manner, took her by the arm and led her forward. Oh, don't be alarmed, Agnes, he said. I've tested your nerve before, and have never seen it fail. Now, let me see your hand. He took it in his and examined it closely. Ah, this is just what I need. He resumed. Long, slender fingers. You have a beautiful hand, Agnes. Well, this embarrassed her, but she became stronger. Now, my child, I must learn the nature of the wound in this young man's head. Come a little closer, my dear. He doesn't know what's going on. So, um, have you ever seen him before? No, she replied, approaching nearer and regarding his face steadily. But he appears to be a man of means and refinement. Uh, that is clear. But come closer, Agnes. Why, well, you're right, look. You see, it's a small hole, and that probably accounts for the fact that he's still alive. But it has penetrated the skull, and that makes the case a very serious one. It's necessary that I know what made the wound in order to determine what to do, and the quickest way in the world is to let the wound tell its own story. My fingers are so thick that I can do nothing, but yours are uh, exactly suited. My fingers? What do you want me to do, Father? Right. I want you to insert a finger in the wound. Tell me what you find. After a careful examination of the edges of the bone. The girl hesitated. Why? she asked. So that I may know what instrument was employed. If the hole's round and has rather clean edges, it was made by a bullet, in which event there is no reasonable hope of recovery. If, however, it's three-cornered, or otherwise angular, or in any great degree ragged, and something else made it, pickaxe or some other instrument, in that case, there's a bare chance of saving his life. Besides, the knowledge will be very useful to the officers in digging up what appears to be a mysterious crime. You can ascertain that, can't you? I'll try. So under her father's direction, but in a gingerly manner, she stood behind the young man's head, her face close above his, and put the fine long forefinger of her left hand into the wound. As she did so, her eyes met the empty stare of his. Very slowly and carefully, watching his face all the time, she felt the edges of the bone and then withdrew her finger. It's smooth and round, she said. Ah, oh, exclaimed the father. Then there's no hope, poor fellow. But let us try a little further, Agnes, my dear. You did that bravely, as I knew you would. 
now I want you to put your finger in again and push it very slowly and carefully as far as you can. The bullet may not have gone far. The girl again looking down upon the calm, peaceful face, with its blank stare and senseless smile, explored the wound with her finger. Her touch was sure and gentle, but as her finger came in contact with the brain, and she felt its warmth and the regular and smooth pressure of the pulsations, her nerves went upon a strain. Still, she looked down into the young handsome face, but she was growing pale. All of a sudden, for some wholly unaccountable reason, the young man's blank expression and silly smile passed away, and a certain intelligence sat upon his face. The surgeon saw this, and it appeared to him to be a matter of uncommon importance. At the same moment, a peculiar look came into his daughter's face. She had begun to relax in the course of fainting, but instantly she swung back upon a nervous balance which was so prominent as to suggest a strong stimulation. The young man looked up into her eyes with a vague interest. She looked down into his with fear and horror. And then she suddenly withdrew her finger and stepped back beyond the range of his vision. The look of vacuity again took a hold upon it. The girl, without addressing anyone particularly, said nervously and hurriedly, "'You'd better send to the bank and tell his father.' "'What bank?' asked her father in surprise. "'The Citizens Bank.' "'Who is his father?' "'Mr. Blanchard, the president of the bank. This is his son, Charles.' Her father regarded her with amazement, but he refrained from asking her questions. He merely remarked, "'But you said just now that you did not know him.' girl looked confused and made no reply. The surgeon sent an officer to the bank. His attention then returned to the patient, and as his daughter had not made as thorough an examination as he desired, he asked her if she felt strong enough to make another attempt. Well, she complied, but with much hesitation. Again, a sickness and weakness assailed her as her finger slipped into the wound, and again the young man's face brightened. He fixed his eyes on her face, seemingly in recognition, and in a thick, stammering voice he said, Why, Agnes, is it you? So you are the one. This is what jealousy has done. This is what I get for being his friend. Do you blame me, Charles? Why should I? It's too late for that now. Does Frank know? He does not, but she is madly in love with him. And she's a stranger to you? Absolutely. I never saw her before. I believe he has her in hiding, and that he'll shield her. But he's not a traitor. Oh, she may have some unaccountable hold upon him. He would not deceive me so. Well, who can tell? Well, the excitement which had kept back the encroachment of weakness, now failed its purpose. The girl withdrew her finger, and the young man sank back into his former lethargic condition. All colour fled the girl's face. Her eyes were fixed vacantly in a stare of horror. Agnes, said her father, approaching her hastily. What's the matter? Are you faint? I, I don't know, father. She trembled as though with apoplexy. What is all that he's been telling you? He asked. She was far too gone to reply, but her father mistook her weakness for hesitation. Come into the open air, my child. This repulsive ordeal and the ravings of that delirious man have borne too heavily upon your nerves. Come, my daughter. Well, those were his words, but a great dread had arisen within him. As soon as they'd stepped out, he pressed the question upon her with a certain hardness which came from his anxiety. What does this all mean? What do you know about the shooting? Her voice was kept back by a gasp, and with a lurch she slipped from her father's grasp and went all disorganized down to the ground before he could save her. He picked her up, placed her in the buggy, and drove rapidly to his home. When she recovered... She found her mother in anxious watch upon her, for her father had gone to see what could be done for the wounded man. 
Mrs. Osborne had been informed by her husband of the singular occurrence at the receiving hospital, and the good woman was unhappy over it. But with her usual flair of tact, she asked no questions, believing that the close understanding between her and her daughter would bring forth an explanation in safe time. She was disappointed, therefore, when Agnes, upon coming into consciousness, spoke no word of the most important matter. More than that, she said she had a grievous headache and desired to be left alone, that she might sleep. Mrs. Osborne withdrew, and immediately the girl went to the task of slipping away from the house unseen. And she did this with complete success. In a few minutes, she was in the office of a young physician named Frank Armour. Well, there was nothing commonplace in this young man's appearance. He was tall, slender, and pale, and to the manifest effects of rigorous study was added evidence of some kind of trouble that was wearing him out. He occupied two rooms, a reception room and behind it a consultation room. She found him sitting in the front room. The door leading into the other was closed. His face brightened greatly when he saw her standing before him. Agnes, he cried. I'm very glad to see you. All loaves drop from my shoulders when your sweet face appears. Well, you said the other day that you weren't coming to the office anymore, for fear that people would talk about you, as though that should make any difference, seeing that we're soon to be married. His manner was so gentle, so full of evidence of genuine affection, that her suspicions concerning him were much weakened. But she'd come to make sure of her position, and the mysteries of the wounded man's speech had to be cleared up. Frank, she asked, have you seen your friend Charles Blanchard today? No, I haven't seen him since last night. He scolded me again for not taking him around to your house and introducing him to you. Now really, Agnes, I don't think you ought to be putting me off about bringing him. Yes, he really is a very delightful man, and I'm sure you'd like him. We'll talk about that some other time, Frank. There's something else I want to ask you now. Do you really think you love me and me alone? I'm certain of it, Agnes, but I don't see any reason for such a question. I know that you never go into society, and you've told me that you pay attention to no one except me. Well, that's the truth, Agnes, but to save my life, I don't understand you. You're pale and ill. Something's happened to give you trouble, and you've suddenly become suspicious of me. Hmm. Should she tell him of the fatal wounding of his best friend? Was it not possible first to extort from him some explanation of that friend's singular disclosures? The fact that she had received this knowledge from him, if indeed knowledge it was, troubled her greatly. The man had sown distrust in her mind, and it was like poison. Frank, she said presently, unable to see him longer in ignorance of his friend's condition. Charles Blanchard has been seriously hurt, and I came to tell you. Seriously hurt? asked Armour in alarm. When? And how? He was found less than two hours ago and taken to the receiving hospital where my father's attending to him now. The young physician was now upon his feet, nervous and excited. How was he hurt, Agnes? Tell me all about it. Nothing's known except that he was found staggering along the street with a pistol wound in the head. Armour's face was now livid, and his trembling legs nearly failed to support his weight. He was not killed instantly, he asked. No, but he is unconscious. Well, certainly. Well, the bullet must have been a small one. <sighs> no doubt, no doubt, cried the unhappy man. Well, I must go see him at once. He picked up his hat and was starting away, expecting her to leave the room with him. But she sat still, remarking... I'll wait until you return, if you promise to come back soon. Well, Armour's disappointment and annoyance were visibly manifest. He shot a quick glance toward the door of the adjoining room and then walked over to it and cautiously tried the knob. The door was locked. He made a show of feeling in his pocket for the key, but his whole manner was so openly embarrassed that the sharp-sighted girl noticed it. Agnes, he said, turning upon her somewhat impatiently, there's no doubt I should be gone a long time, and it would be unreasonable for me to ask you to wait. Nevertheless, 
she said in a rather hard tone, looking him steadily in the eyes. And I will stay here and wait for you. If you stay away long, I'll turn on the spring latch and lock the door when I leave. An evident fear seized upon the young physician. He was anxious to go to his suffering friend and was unwilling to leave Agnes in his office. She saw all this very clearly. And, um, uh, by the way, Frank, she resumed, as I'm very tired, I'll go into the back room and rest on the lounge. She started toward the door, pretending not to have noticed that it was locked, and tried to open it. Why, it's locked, she exclaimed. Arma's uneasiness had increased to a positive suffering. Uh, yes, he stammered. Is anyone in there? Agnes, uh, well, <laughs> you're acting in a strange and unaccountable way today. I? she asked in great astonishment. I don't understand you, Frank. Then she walked straight up to him, and placing her hands on his shoulders set with dignity and tenderness. I merely asked you if there was anyone in the room, and you're offended. Let's be candid with each other, Frank. What does it mean? I, um, I may have a patient in that room, and... Uh... A low moaning in a woman's voice, indistinctly heard from the inner room, interrupted him. His face turned scarlet and then pale, and all the time the steady gaze of the surgeon's daughter was upon him. She took her hands from his shoulders, looking much humiliated, and with a painful sadness which he had never seen before in her conduct, she simply said, I don't think it's customary for physicians to lock their patients up, but if I've been rude, I beg you to forgive me. But I'll not annoy you by staying. Goodbye, Frank. She extended her hand, which he seized eagerly, but she quickly withdrew it and left the room. He followed her into the passageway. Agnes, he said, surely you don't suspect that... But she was already fleeing down the stairs so rapidly that he could not finish this foolish sentence. And the girl went so quickly along the crowded street that people turned in wonder to look at her. Her eyes were filled with tears, her face was very pale and her lips were tightly caught between her teeth. I never would have dreamed it, she said to herself over and over. Never, never. It will kill me, it will kill me. She re-entered her home as secretly as she left it, flung herself wearily upon her bed and cried as though her heart were broken. The police had gone intelligently about their work upon the mystery of the shooting. Mr. Blanchard, the father of the wounded man, had arrived, overcome with grief and horror. Dr. Armour, he said, was the only intimate friend his son had. He was entirely unable to suggest any cause for the shooting, which undoubtedly had not been done with a suicidal hand. Police repeated to him all that they could remember of the disjointed and unintelligible conversation between his son and Agnes Osborne, and this account puzzled him greatly. What mysterious bind was there between his son and this young woman? Well, she denied all knowledge of him, yet she gave the information of his identity. When and how had he been her friend, not knowing her? Why had she discovered an anxiety that he should not blame her for the deed that would cost him his life? Why was she desirous of learning from him whether Frank Armour knew anything about the tragedy? And who was this who was madly in love with Armour, what possible connection could there be between this fact and that of the shooting? Who was the woman referred to in their conversation, and why should Armour keep her in hiding? How could her jealousy of young Blanchard be the moving cause of this desperate assault? Mr. Blanchard was not the only one who tried to bring some light out of the darkness of all this singular and deplorable transaction. A broken-hearted girl, tossing and weeping on her bed, asked herself these questions, some of them many times, and the police were weighing them with all the care and precision of trained hunters of crime. But with Dr. Osborne, the matter was far more serious than with the police. Lacking his knowledge that the young man's temporary restoration to a state of consciousness was not explainable on any ordinary grounds, 
They didn't see the true value of the fact Dr. Osborne reasoned that a wound of that character must necessarily produce a disorganization of the mental functions and present a condition of unconsciousness. This had been the case until his daughter had inserted her finger into the wound, when at once the sufferer's face brightened and a condition resembling consciousness ensued. Dr. Osborne was too wise to assume that young Blanchard's ability to speak and apparently carry forward a conversation was positive evidence of consciousness, for he knew that the vagaries of a disorganized mind are of unimaginable variety. But this case was unique. Nothing in the books or his experience had a suggestion of its form or color. The whole case was this. His daughter had displayed fright upon seeing the wounded man at the station, but had recovered from that, and indeed her condition might have been construed as one of natural repugnance, overcome by an intelligent direction of the will. And it was clear enough so far. When she placed her finger in the edge of the wound, there was sign neither of recognition on her part, nor consciousness on his. Ah, it was only when she pushed her finger into the brain that those two facts came into existence. This appeared to the surgeon to be a very strange coincidence. Not only was the young man apparently restored to consciousness, but the two, supposed to have been strangers, recognized each other and, worse than all else, betrayed a certain ill-defined common knowledge of the crime. All these things threw Dr. Osborne into the most conflicting surmises and brought him into a condition of positive unhappiness. The extraordinary scientific features of the case were overshadowed by his anxieties. His daughter had engaged herself with his assistant to marry Dr. Armour, and yet this young physician had been placed in a peculiar light by the words of the dying man. Prolonged thinking brought only wider distraction, and the unhappy father determined to question his daughter, depending on the close sympathy between them to bring the whole truth out of her. And it was some time, however, before he could find the opportunity. Mr. Blanchard had removed his son to his home and had retained Dr. Osborne to attend to him. When the surgeon had done all that was possible, he went to his home and sought his daughter. But she could not be found. After nearly crying her heart out upon her return from Armour's office, she got up, brought herself under control, and then realised that she had been treated shamefully by the man whom she loved above all others in the world. It was easy for her grief to become shame and her shame to become anger. It was not possible for her yet to think seriously upon any plan that might bring suffering or ruin to her lover. But it was within her power to work serious mischief to some mysterious woman who'd come between her and him, and this was a matter to be attended to. Accordingly, she cleared up her face, made herself very bright and pretty, and went at once to consult the chief of police. That functionary was vastly surprised to see her. He'd been given a full report of the scene at the receiving hospital, and when he saw the girl enter his office looking so bright, confident and handsome, and announce her name and mission, well, he was perplexed. In truth, Chief Holloway had certain ideas which would have given Miss Agnes discomfort if she'd known of their existence. "'I've come to ask you, Mr. Holloway,' she said, "'if you've made any discoveries concerning the shooting of Mr. Blanchard. The officer, somewhat taken aback by her directness, tried, after a heavy fashion, to cover his position under some remarks in which discretion was outlined as a duty. But this is a rather singular question from you, Miss Osborne, considering that you yourself are supposed to know all about the matter. Well, the very boldness and brutality of this assault served an excellent purpose. For the girl, not dreaming that her talk with young Blanchard had taken wings, or that anyone suspected her of the knowledge, was shocked with surprise. Well, what makes you think that? she quickly asked. This put him in command of the situation, for he now felt his power. Your conversation with the young Blanchard showed that both you and he knew all about it, and then, after you left him, you went to see Dr. Armour, who also appears to be pretty badly mixed up in the whole affair. All well, this came like a whirlwind, and badly frightened the girl. Now, resumed Holloway, 
Although you have come ostensibly to make inquiries, I think your ultimate purpose was to give some very important information, and I should be pleased to hear it. Magnus caught her breath. How can I know anything? she asked, realizing that her time had come, but with a rush that unnerved her. Well, Mr. Blanchard spoke in a rambling way. And he was not as evasive as you are at this moment. Evasive? Really, sir? This is no time for byplay, the officer sternly interrupted. No doubt you understand that you yourself are in a very peculiar position. If what you know would endanger your own safety by you telling it, I can easily understand your feelings. Well, the sting was felt, but the girl rallied and gave this opinion. You said something just now that makes me think you suspect Dr. Armour of having a guilty knowledge of the affair. If you mean by that to charge him with the crime, well, you're entirely in error. But you are careful not to deny that he knows something of importance. Why do you not say openly that you and Armour know who fired the shots, and that you two possibly for prudential reasons, are doing all you can to conceal your knowledge and shield the criminal. Well, the very brutality and directness of this question roused the inmost nature of the girl. With scarlet face and flashing eyes, she said, If you'll come with me, I will show you the murderer. Well, this was a windfall that Holloway had not dared to hope for. He promptly followed Agnes. When they reached the street, she said, It'll be necessary to see Dr. Armour first, and I think he's at Mr. Blanchard's. Uh, we'll go there first. As you please. They found both Dr. Armour and Dr. Osborne at the young man's house. The two physicians, the father and the lover, were vastly surprised to see Agnes and the chief of police walk in together. And for her part, Agnes felt so guilty that she couldn't bear to look Armour full in the face. She felt that a wild jealousy had led her to take a desperate and dangerous step, the end of which she could not foresee. But did her lover really deserve to be spared? Had he not deceived her shamefully? The young man felt that a high barrier had come between him and Agnes, and he had nothing to say to her. Holloway readily saw that a heavy constraint rested upon them both, and it appeared, in his eyes, an important affair. Agnes, said her father, taking her by the hand and looking her anxiously in the eyes. Where have you been? To see Mr. Holloway, father. For what purpose? To learn if he discovered anything. This was not the place for pressing the matter, and so her father asked her no more questions. There was a moment of general embarrassment among the four persons in the room. It was broken by the chief, who asked that... In the cause of justice, Miss Osborne be permitted to repeat the experiment of inserting her finger in the wound. With surprising alacrity, both the physicians objected, saying that the wound had been dressed, that the sufferer was then very low from shock, and that such an experiment would likely have a fatal issue. Holloway smiled in a peculiar manner, and, looking steadily at Armour, added, I hardly expected that you consent. This thrust cut the young man to the quick, and he shot a look at Agnes that revealed his suspicion of her hand in the policy of the officer. Of course, I have no desire to increase the young man's danger, remarked Holloway, but the result of the former experiment was so important that I deemed it advisable to repeat it, if possible. However, I think it's hardly necessary. As soon as I'd learned all the particulars of that experiment, I laid them before a prominent physician of this city and requested his written opinion concerning them. I think this is the proper time to inform you concerning it for several reasons which will appear later. Thereupon, Holloway read an ingenious paper, only a short extract from which can be set forth here. It is as follows. Admitting a wide latitude for deception on the part of the young woman and the possibility of error in your accounts. The whole affair seems preposterous and not worthy of serious attention, but we shall treat it not as a fact, but as a uh, hypothetical case. 
The hypothesis was here stated in agreement with the reported facts, and this explanation followed. The bullet was small, and hence the laceration on the brain matter was not extensive, nor the primary shock very great. The unconsciousness observed apparently resulted from the severing of the nerves ramifying throughout the brain and from the rupturing of the innumerable chains of brain cells in the path of the bullets. Now these lacerations, by destroying the continuity of the brain texture, disorganized the mind by interrupting the coordination of its functions. Now if some plan could be devised for bringing together the severed ends of tissue in such a manner as would permit of their resuming their normal occupation of transmitting molecular activity, there is a rare possibility that its employment would have restored consciousness. By a very singular accident, the young woman may have performed that service when she inserted her finger deep into the brain. But in order for this result to have been accomplished, a most extraordinary series of events must have occurred. Now, the finger is a sensitive member, from the fact that it contains so large a number of nerves. And these nerves, called peripheral, terminate under a thin cuticle, through which sensation easily is experienced. When her finger was inserted in the brain tissue, her nerve ends came approximately in contact with the severed nerves of the brain over the entire field of laceration. Thus, the mechanical condition of nerve continuity was restored in the brain of the wounded man, and consciousness was the result but it's evident that the molecular transmission did not occur directly through her finger. And that was not possible, for the reason that her nerves do not run straight through her finger from one side to the other. Well, if we should trace one of these nerves, we should find that, starting at the termination in the finger, it runs up the arm and into the brain. The sensation, starting from the end and going to the brain, would there meet and be assimilated by a large number of other sensations, this being the result of coordination. The brain would then decide what action to take, and then would direct the efferent or outrunning nerves to move the muscles with a definite purpose. It is clear, then, that the movement of sensation through the wounded man's brain tissue after the restoration of continuity must have become communicated to the nervous system of the woman. In other words, no sensation could pass through his brain without passing through hers also. In this way, their two brains would act largely as one, and the active thoughts of one would be known to the other. By this sort of reasoning, we may account for the fact that, although the two persons were strangers to each other, mutual recognition came when the knowledge of both became the possession of each. Hence, we must infer that the young woman knows as much concerning the person who did the shooting as does the wounded man himself. Now, the effect of this extraordinary document can hardly be imagined. From Dr. Osborne, it lifted a load that was likely to crush him. But why had not his daughter been candid with him? Now that there could no longer be a fair suspicion that she had any criminal association with the crime, why had she acted in so strange a manner? Lama's thoughts took a very different turn. His pallor increased until it became alarming, and his knees were unsteady from weakness. The man's agony was so painfully visible that Agnes felt a fearful dread for the end that must come. The immediate result of all this was that the three men fixed a steady gaze upon her, in which was a commingling of peculiar motives and sensations. Miss Osborne, Holloway said, finally, this scientific report leads us to believe that you are fully aware of the identity of the one who fired the shot. Well, in corroboration of these conclusions, you have confessed your knowledge by offering your services to point out a murderer to me. Would you be so kind as to keep your promise? All that was womanly in the girl found cause both for alarm and encouragement in this situation. Against her sense of wrong weighed that of tenderness and affection. She found courage to look Armour squarely in the face, hoping to receive some sign that he might guide her but she found, as she read his expression, only contempt and defiance struggling through the cloud of anguish which sat upon him. I will keep my promise, she said with much firmness. We'll now go to Dr. Armour's office. Besides becoming somewhat more rigid, as though bracing himself to meet some fearful ordeal, 
Armour betrayed no emotion. Dr. Osborne appeared to be overcome with astonishment and anxiety. Chief Holloway only smiled. These four went at once to Armour's office in utter silence, each feeling the imminence of a catastrophe. The young physician admitted them into the outer room and then closed the door. With great abruptness, he then asked this question. Will someone be kind enough to explain the object of this visitation? Holloway was on the point of speaking, but Agnes stepped in before him, and, looking Armour firmly in the face, said, I believe that the person who committed this crime is concealed in your consultation room. If I'm wrong, heaven will punish me as I deserve. So far as I'm able to discover, no reason exists why I should pretend to deny the knowledge which I have. The murderer is a woman, and you're concealing and shielding her in that room. Armour, though pale as death, did not flinch before this accusation. On the contrary, his chest expanded, his eyes flashed, and, with head thrown back, he said, It was a woman who did the shooting, as I now believe, and it is true that she, at this moment, is kept in concealment by me in the inner office. I would hoped to be able to conceal her act from the world, but for if ever there was an occasion for the exercise of the noblest human traits, it is in the case before us. Let me tell you something. You who mistake suspicion for skill in unearthing crime, and you who are moved by even less worthy motives, crime cannot exist in the absence of accountability. Has it occurred to you to imagine that this woman may not have been responsible for her act? Do you know what an epileptic fit is? Well, surely you do, Dr. Osborne. You're familiar with the strange forms which this disease may take. You know that the sweetest natures are at times wholly perverted by it, that its manifestations are complex and obscure, that sometimes, instead of the violent spasms with which we are all familiar, the malady takes the form of mental and physical activity, in which we find an impulse to commit extraordinary acts as the result of monstrous misconceptions. And when this condition occurs, all the principles of the victim's nature may be wholly eclipsed. Consciousness entirely suppressed, and the power to discriminate between right and wrong completely lost. After the attack has passed, there remains no recollection of what was done during its continuance. Well, I inform you, and I am able to prove my assertion, that the woman who shot my dearest friend is now in my inner office, that she came to me from a distant city only yesterday to be treated for this very malady, that very soon after her arrival I informed her, as was my duty and pleasure, that I was engaged to marry a very charming and kind-hearted young lady. Well, it is a breach of delicate confidence on my part to inform you that, in spite of her brave effort to appear glad for my good fortune, she could not conceal a certain unhappiness which I know was perfectly natural. But it is my duty now to tell you everything. I now know that the sorrow which my news caused her brought on an attack of what is known as mast epilepsy, to which she is subject. The thing uppermost in her mind was that someone was dearer to me than she was. Although normally a woman of unexampled sweetness and goodness, she determined in her condition of temporary insanity to kill that person. I need not inform you that she must have started out with a clear purpose of killing the young lady to whom I was engaged. But she knew also that young Blanchard was my dearest friend, and, in her wild mental condition, she happened to find him fast, and she fired into his brain the bullet that was intended for another. The man paused a while, but he did not cast a glance at Agnes, who, feeling unaccountably faint at these strange revelations, had sunk helpless upon a chair. Mr. Holloway, resumed Armour, I ask your promise that you will not arrest this woman now, but that you take proper steps to verify my assertions. And as she's recovered from the attack and has no recollection whatsoever of the tragedy, you say nothing to her about it now, and that you never mention it to a soul if you find that what I've told you is true. I cheerfully give those two promises, said Holloway. Then, said Armour, I'll present the lady to you. And with that, he went to the door of the inner room, unlocked it, and stepped within. In the next moment, he returned, supporting on his arm a pale, sweet-faced, beautiful woman of fifty, 
in whose sad and gentle face was no trace of the fearful thing she'd done. Arma, with his head thrown back and glowing with all the pride of a gentleman, thus presented her. Miss Osborne, gentlemen, I have the honour to make you acquainted with my mother. Go on now, admit it. You did not see that end coming, did you? Not at all. Well, I didn't. Yeah, uh, it seemed so logical when it actually came around, didn't it? But, well, nope. I had no idea that was going to happen in the end at all whatsoever. An old school classic there for your Wednesday evening's entertainment. So, what should I do on Friday? Let me know. Before that, we've got another podcast coming up tomorrow night over on the second channel. And anywhere where you choose to get your podcast as well, of course. But, yep. Yeah, Looking for uh, inspiration for Friday evening. Got stuff lined up for Sunday and Monday next week, but not quite sure what to do on Friday. Any thoughts? Anything you want me to do? Let me know. Until then, very, very sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. Really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.